All right, if everybody wants to come on in and grab a seat, we'll get started with our worship tonight. We'll get started by singing number 898. 898. <clears throat> We'll sing the first and third verse. As I travel through life with its trouble and strife, I'm glorious, hope to give cheer on the way. Through my toil will be your and rest on that shore where the night has been turned into day. Up in the beautiful paradise, side by side, the river of life. Up in the Is the wonderful flower we love up in the beautiful paradise valley by side of the river of life up in the valley the wonderful valley will be free from all pain and all strife there we shall live in the roasted garden be the shade of the evergreen tree. How I long for the paradise I read, where the beauty of heaven I'll see. And our song before the scripture reading and prayer tonight will be number 71. 71, as the deer. We'll sing both verses of this. <clears throat> As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are not desire, and I long to worship you. Scripture reading prayer. <laughs> scripture reading tonight is taken from the book of Revelations, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. It's Revelations 5, 1 through 10. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back. Sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth 
or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us as kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Will you join us for pray? Our dear and most loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we do and really thank you and praise you, Father, for our day and for the blessings of this day it's been ours to enjoy. Father, we are so thankful that we are assembled here this evening. We're thankful, Father, for the avenue of prayer. Thank you for Jesus, our intercessor, who is at the right hand of the Father, who intercedes and on our behalf as we pray. And Father, we thank you for that privilege that we could approach your throne of grace. Father, we are thankful for the reading of your word tonight. Father, we know your word is living and powerful. It's able to transform sinners into children of God. And Father, we're so thankful for that peace of mind that we have through the scriptures that help, that encouragement. Father, we just thank you for that precious word that we have that we can read and study. Father, help us to always be mindful to use your word uh, to tell others about Jesus and his wonderful love. Father, we're thankful tonight for this time we've come again to hear a portion of your word preached, and we're thankful for Andy as he gave a good sermon this morning. We're thankful for him and his hard studies, Father, as he prepares lessons for us uh, that we could understand your word even more. Father, we pray for him tonight that he'll preach the word you've laid on his heart for us tonight. Father, we're so thankful for our church family here at Salem. Uh, we're thankful, Father, for the encouragement we get from them, uh, the help that we get Father, for the fellowship we enjoy, for being able to pray for one another. Father, how precious they are to us, and we're thankful for them. Father, we're mindful of many that are uh, not healthy. Uh, we pray for our elderly, our sick and shut in, our suffering and those bereaved. Father, we just pray for each and every one. We hope and pray uh, for better health for them and for those situations they're in that they need our encouragement and prayers we pray continually for them Father we're thankful for our Salem family here our elders we pray for them as they lead us spiritually uh, we're thankful for our deacons as they serve we're thankful for their families and we pray for them we pray for all of our congregation, Father, that we'd ever be busy about your work. Father, we're praying tonight also for Perry and his group, as in a few days they'll head back home. Uh, we pray, Father, for a safe journey uh, to bring them home safely to us. 
Father, we're thankful for the good works going on there in Thailand and pray, Father, for others uh, that are going on around the world in the mission efforts. Pray that you continue to bless those efforts, Father. As doors are closed, we pray that you'll open other doors uh, that the gospel message might be preached and taught. Father, we love you tonight. Uh, we pray as we worship tonight, our worship will be pleasing in your sight. May we glorify your name and yours alone. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Andy asked me to lead a couple of songs before his lesson, so we'll go ahead and do those. And y'all just bear with me, because one of them I haven't ever led before. We'll start with number 230. 230. <laughs> we'll sing the first and third of this as well. Worthy of praise is Christ our Redeemer. Worthy of glory, honor, and power. Worthy of all. Worthy art thou, worthy art thou, worthy of riches, blessings, and honor, worthy of wisdom, glory, and power, worthy of earth and heaven's thanksgiving, worthy art thou. If you'd like, you can stand while we sing number 258. This will be our song before Andy comes up and presents his lesson. 258. <clears throat> we'll sing the first and the third verse. It thrills my soul to hear the songs of praise we mortals sing below. And though it takes the body of the wages and I must Sing and have a new song 
Invitation song tonight will be number 909-909. Thank you, Colton. Well done. Good evening, church. Good to see all of you here this afternoon for worship. So glad you've come. So glad you're part of our assembly today. A little boy was seated in the auditorium by his dad. When he happened to notice something new was on display up in the pulpit area. A flag was there, and that was not usually the case. What's that flag doing there, he asked his dad. His dad said, well, tomorrow is Memorial Day, so I guess it's a tribute to people who died in the service. The little boy thought for a little while, and he said, uh, the morning service or the evening service? You know, some stay away from worship services like they're trying to avoid death. What are they thinking when they think that way, when they do that? Some get too little out of worship because they go too little, put too little into it, or they started too late, started the habit too late. One little boy returned to his home from the first time uh, in attending a, a worship privilege and he was asked why, how it went, and he said, well, the singing was nice, but the commercial was too long. I wonder, I wonder, do, do those who dislike the worship of God, as it is done in the New Testament, ever think about being in heaven and what it will be like to be there? How can one imagine going to heaven without having God in his life? When one gets to heaven, if the book of Revelation tells us anything, when one gets to heaven, he, she, will live eternally worshiping God. Look at Revelation, the book of Revelation again, please. Uh, Larry read our text just a few minutes ago, and that's in chapter 5. But I want to look, first of all, at the beginning of the book. Revelation 1 through 3, those first three chapters... In those first three chapters, John's attention is drawn to the earth and to the way things were during his time. He saw Christ amid the church, and he heard the seven letters describing the weaknesses and uh, needs and sins of those congregations and of the church at the time. So in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, the attention, the focus is on the struggles the churches faced. Then we come to chapter 4. And in chapter 4, the scene suddenly changes. The same voice, the first voice John heard speak, sounded like a trumpet when it said, and can you imagine this? being in exile on the Isle of Patmos. Pretty much alone, he probably was. And hearing this great voice say, speaking from heaven, say, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Come up here, and I will show you. And John is welcomed then into the very throne room of God. And God is worshipped, 
And at his throne, the redeemed sang a new song. This afternoon, our lesson is Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. A new song. Worthy is the Lamb. Just two things I want to do, and as we develop this study of Revelation 5, verses 1 through 10, and the first is to discuss the background of the song. We'll look at the song, which is recorded at the end of our text. But before we get to the song itself, let's see the things that led up to it, the background of the song. In Revelation chapter 4, John describes a scene that is meant to dazzle the eyes and stagger the imagination. It's a, a picture revealed to us to make us marvel at the magnificence of God. At the center stage, the center of the stage, is the throne, the seat of the Almighty. And pulsating from the throne are the dazzling colors of a rainbow. Encircling the throne is a ring of thrones, and on them are aged men, white-robed and golden-crowned. Thunder and flashes of lightning came from the throne, and seven torches are flared up at the foot of the throne. And between John and that raw power and glory was this shining expanse, a sea of glass. What a vision! Words like glory, magnificence, splendor, power, and might come to mind. The primary verb purpose of the vision is to impact our minds. As we read Revelation chapter 4, uh, it, the, the vision described there that was given to John impacts our minds with the greatness of God. The focal point is the throne. Notice that. The 24 elders are seated around the throne. Verse 4 of Revelation 4. The lightning and thunder come from the throne. Verse 5. The sevenfold spirit and sea of glass are before the throne. Verses 5 and 6. The four creatures are in the center and around the throne. Verse 6. Worship is directed toward the throne. Verses 9 and 10. You know, nothing can change a man's pers perspective the way seeing God's glory can. When the enemies of truth were enraged at Stephen for what he was preaching, and gritted their teeth at him, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, says Acts chapter 7 and verse 55. And that gave him the strength to die with a prayer on his lips. Whenever we grow discouraged and our strength seems to fail, let us look through the open door of God's Word and see what Isaiah saw the Lord sitting on his throne high and lifted up. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. It will change how you look at life. John must have been captivated by the glorious scene before him. His eyes searched and examined every feature. In such a wondrous picture, there is one thing, however... There is one thing, it's such a glorious, wonderful picture, so much to see, but there's one thing that he focuses his mind on that disturbs him. He wrote in verse 1 of chapter 5, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Now chapter 4 centers on worship to God as creator. 
the song of that chapter, the song of Revelation chapter 4 is, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Revelation 4 verse 11. But chapter 5, in chapter 5, there is featured the worship to Christ as the Redeemer. Chapter 4, God is the Creator. Chapter 5, Christ is the Redeemer. The throne remains at center stage. The elders, the creatures, and the seven spirits are still present in Revelation 5. But something very different is there. And it made John cry. There's a scroll laying on God's right hand, and it was sealed, sealed with seven seals. Important documents were sealed with wax and then embossed by the insignia of the owner, and that's for three reasons. Important documents were sealed in that manner for three different reasons. The seals verified ownership. The seals assured genuineness. And the seals protected the contents. Now the fact that this particular scroll, laying on the right hand of the one on the throne, the fact that it was sealed with seven seals, meant that it was completely sealed. It was perfectly sealed. It was divinely sealed. No one could know what was inside, what was on that scroll. No one could know the message. No one could know what was in it, the contents of it, until he broke the seals. What's on that scroll? As long as it's sealed, we'll never know. But we need to know what's on that scroll. What is the message? that's being hidden there, the message that is sealed up there, divinely sealed up. We must know what's on that scroll. And so there's a mighty angel shouting, Who is worthy? Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And there's no one. There's no one. There are 24 elders. None is worthy. The seven spirits are there. John is seeing this. And no one is worthy to... Oh, this, the seals cannot be broken. The message cannot be revealed. And that makes John sad. And he begins to wail bitterly. Not just weep, as is suggested by our English text. But he wails bitterly because no one, we're told... No one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look in it. Revelation 5 and verse 4. I call this from squalling to singing. In the background of the song, there is squalling. In the song, there is singing. So John is wailing bitterly, for no one is worthy to open the scroll and to reveal its contents. And one of those 24 elders says, stop it. Weep no more. There are 24 of these elders. They symbolize victorious Christians. And one of them said, look at the lion of the tribe of Judah. He can open the scroll. And then John saw him. John then saw the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, in verse 5. But, as John sees him, he is standing as though he has been slain. He is bloody as he has been killed. He has been slaughtered. He has been slain, but he is standing. And that is most significant. He has been standing, but why can he open the scroll? Because he has conquered. 
That's verse 5 of Revelation 5. The New American Standard Bible says in that verse, The root of David has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. He is the overcomer. He is standing. He looks as though he has been slain. But he is standing because he has conquered. He has overcome. He has overcome life's disappointments. He has overcome temptation. He has overcome the constant onslaughts of Satan. He has overcome death. And he is qualified to break the seals and to open the scroll, unroll that scroll, because he is the winner. He is victorious. The bloody, victorious Lamb, Jesus, then takes the scroll from the hand of God on the throne, and when He does, all the saints, all the redeemed of the ages, fall down before Him. Each one has his guitar. Kithara is what John wrote. That's where we get our English word guitar. It's translated harps. I like guitar. But it's translated harps, appropriately so, in verse 8. And then there are the prayers. The prayers are symbolized by the incense. And the singing of the saints is symbolized by the harps. The symbolism underscores the fact that the four creatures and the 24 elders were ready to praise the Lord. And they sang a new song, says verse 9. Now that's the background of the song. That's what John saw. That's what John experienced before he heard the singing. Next, there is the song itself. The wife asked her husband, Why do you go outside every time I sing? Don't you like my singing? Oh, he said, Oh, honey, it's not that. It's not that. I just want the neighbors to know that I'm not beating you. Whenever the noted agnostic Robert Ingersoll died, the printed funeral notices said, quote, There will be no singing. Along with other things, obituary, whatever, there was that notice printed on, There will be no singing. Well, don't be looking for hymns, anthems, oratorios, carols, and spiritual songs among infidels, agnostics, or skeptics. Without God, without Christ, without redemption, without a divine revelation, and without hope, what do they have to sing about? And what do those who attend their funerals have to sing about? There will be no singing. But there will be singing in heaven. There will be singing in heaven. The four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, and they sang a new song. It's not just any song, it's a new song. And that word that John used has a very specific meaning. The word translated new. He could have used one of uh, either one of two different words in his language, in the language in which he's writing. But he used this word. Because this word means that which is unaccustomed, that which is unused. It refers not new in time, not new in time, not recent, but new as to form, new as to quality, of a different nature from what is contrasted as old. It is a new song. It is a song appropriate for a new heaven and a new earth, which uses the same word for new. The Old Testament spoke of a new song that would be sung when the Messiah came. Isaiah wrote about it. Here's what he said in chapter 42 and verse 1. Behold my servant. That chapter is about God's servant. It's about Jesus Christ. 
Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights, God said. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. That's verse 1. But go down to verses 10 and 11 in Isaiah 42. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise from the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea. The coastlands and their inhabitants, sing that new song. Let the desert and its cities lift up their voice. The villages of Kedar, the inhabitants of Selah, shout it from the top of the mountains, this new song. When my Savior comes, when the Messiah, when the Lord comes, sing a new song. The blessing in God's servant is so vast, it affects all of mankind. The coastlands, down on the sea, the desert, its villages, the villages of Kedar, the inhabitants of Pella or Selah. It involves all of mankind, and only praise from all can begin to do justice to its magnitude. So that question, that question that was asked by that mighty angel, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals, is now answered in the song. In Revelation 5 and verse 10. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. The lamb that was slain, he is the one of equal value to the scroll itself. He was slain, but he's standing. He is the one suitable to reveal the contents of the scroll. It's a new song because before the lamb was slain, it could not be sung. David Roper has examined the new song and helped us with three things from it that I wish to share with you now. First of all, the heavenly singers sang of the reason of redemption or for redemption. In verse 9, You were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. You ransomed a people for God. He has acquired us by paying the price. He has paid for us by paying the price. Indeed, as Paul said to the saints, the Christians, members of the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become then bondservants of men. God obtained the church. God bought the church with his own blood, said Paul to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. The heavenly singers also sing of the reach of redemption. By your blood, you ransomed the people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Four terms are used. In the book of Revelation, four is the cosmic number. Four is the number for the earth and things on the earth. We think of it in that way, north, south, east, west, four points on a compass, representative of the earth, the number of creation. Tribe, every family group. Tongue, every linguistic group. People, every social group, and nation, every ethnic group, praises the Lamb who is worthy. Christ died for all, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15. And the heavenly singers also continue the new song with the results of redemption. You have made them, that is the people of God, you ransomed them with your blood, the people of God, and you have made them a kingdom and a priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. That's in verse 10. There's been a lot of discussion and a lot of disagreement on the exact wording of this part of the song. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, which says, uh, you have made them and they shall reign. I noticed uh, Larry's 
uh, reading was different when he read the text earlier. I think he's reading from the New King James Version. And it says, you have made us, and we will reign. Is it, you have made us, and we will reign? Or is it, you have made them, and they shall reign? Is it the case that the redeemed reign, or shall reign at some point yet in the future? Well, those questions are answered for us by very clear teaching in other places in the Bible. I, friends, I want you to think of the Revelation as a part of the New Testament. Yes, it's a book of prophecy. Yes, it's the only book of prophecy in the New Testament. But it's a part of the New Testament. It is the inspired Word of God. Yes, it's a book of symbolism and figures. Yes, but it's a part of the New Testament. It is God's Word, as is the rest of the New Testament. It will not contradict what is said in other places. It cannot contradict and be God's Word. It cannot contradict, say something completely different from what is taught in other places in the New Testament. It's in perfect harmony. The visions may be difficult to see. The figures may be hard and difficult to understand. The application may be more difficult, say, than is the book of Acts. I understand that. But it will not contradict. It still is in perfect harmony with the rest of the New Testament. So if there's other places in the New Testament that talk about the same thing, explain it in more clear terms, it helps us to understand, and we can rely on that. You see, through Christ... And in Christ, we are a special people. That is the church. Those who have put Christ on and are in Christ, members of the church, they are a special people. Titus chapter 2 explains that. Peter wrote this to the first century saints in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. To members of the church, he said, but you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Watch it. A people for his own possession. And if you are priests now, and if you are in Christ, according to Peter, you are priests now. And if you are priest now, then you are a kingdom now. And the new song declares that the slain lamb has made God's people a kingdom and priest to our God. In the beginning of his revelation to the seven churches of Asia, John gave this praise. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. That's Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. But do we reign now? Can we sing that? Can we sing that new song saying in it, we reign now, instead of we will reign at some point in the future. The new song says either we will reign, shall reign, or they shall reign. But can it be the case that we reign now? And, and, and how can that be? It just doesn't seem like it. It just doesn't seem like Christians are in control, ruling, reigning. It sure didn't seem like it in the first century. The song of the redeemed, uh, the song says that the redeemed will predominate, prevail, possess regal authority. In John's day, as Christians were being thrown into prison and fed to lions, it certainly did not appear that they were reigning. And today, as we struggle to promote the good and oppose and overcome the evil, it doesn't seem like we'll ever get ahead. It seems like we're losing all the time. And rather than influence the world for good and for God. But friends, appearances can be and are deceiving. God has assured us that we reign. Indeed, we reign. But in what sense do we reign? Well, we are the kingdom of Christ. 
Again, I refer you back to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6. He has made us, he has saved us from our sins by his blood, and he has made us a kingdom and priests. We are the kingdom of Christ. The kingdom of Christ and God is the church. Jesus said, I will build my church, and Peter, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom. In Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19. We reign because we're the kingdom. We reign since God is our Father, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 3. That means that we are part of, we in Christ, are a part of a royal family. For God is king and God is our Father. We are of royalty. We reign, we rule, because God is our Father. And since Jesus Christ presently reigns, and has been since the beginning of the church, Acts chapter 2, on the day the church was established, Peter preached that, that Jesus is sitting upon his throne, reigning at the right hand of God, reigning over his kingdom. He was that day, he is now, and since we are in Christ, I've put Christ on in baptism. And the Lord has added me to his body. If I'm in Christ and Christ is king, then I'm king. I'm reigning. I am ruling with him. And since we have been saved, death no longer reigns over us. We reign over death. We will never die. We will live forever. We reign and rule over death. But putting the song where it belongs, that is, in the first century. The overcomers reigned on the earth. The song says, and they will reign on the earth. Referring primarily to victory. You see, Rome tried to rule Christians and force them to worship the emperor. But with the strength of a risen Lord, they remained in control of their own lives and destinies. And when we submit our lives to the Lord, He helps us to live triumphant lives, reigning over every obstacle that's put in our way. Our songbooks are filled with songs reflecting the words and the sentiment of Revelation chapter 5. Uh, Colton has, has led us in the singing of the song, Worthy Art Thou, written by uh, a good brother in Christ, Tilly S. Tedley. That is certainly like what will be sung in heaven. We sing it now. Worthy art thou, praising Jesus, who is the one worthy to reveal to us the contents of the scroll, the message from God, the will of of God, the blessings of God, the promises of God. He is worthy to reveal that to us. We praise Him for it. Do you sing the songs with the enthusiasm of Revelation chapter 5? Can you imagine the vision that John saw? Can you imagine the singing? And then Next, after John sees that vision of the 24 elders and the four living creatures representative of all the redeemed, the saints of the, of the earth throughout the ages, singing praises to the, to the Lamb slain but standing, the Lord, the Lion of Judah. And then after that, there are myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands. Can you imagine the fervor, the intensity, the worship in heaven, the enthusiasm as the Lord is worshipped? Do you sing with that enthusiasm today as we worship God? Do you believe the great truths about redemption that are given in that song in Revelation chapter 5? Wonderful truths about redemption. If you do, if you realize those truths, if you believe those great truths, if you do, we pray that you will commit your life to the Lamb that was slain for you, and that you'll do it right now while we're standing and singing. <laughs>
for you and me. Thirsty soul, thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the throne of life. Just a reminder that uh, we're having a VBS meeting after uh, we're dismissed. Uh, Jason Bretherick will be heading that up, so just look for him. It may be in Bible hour. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which classroom, but if you can help with VBS, just maybe even decorating or uh, if you want to teach or whatever, uh, he can use a lot of help with that. So uh, please uh, look up Jason when we get dismissed and be uh, attend the VBS meeting. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. We're going to sing one verse of number 23. If you haven't had a chance to partake of the Lord's Supper, you can head through those double doors in the back, and you'll be shown where to go if you don't know. After we sing this one verse, I'll ask that you all be seated. John has a little presentation for us on Panama, so we'll do that before the closing prayer. 23. <clears throat> there is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great Give me about five minutes and I'll tell you a little bit more about the trip I recently made to Panama. A number of people have asked about that and so I know you're interested in it. Um, three things we wanted to do on this trip, uh, actually four, um, one of which was to change the breaker box. And that's the breaker box of what's left of it run under the, under the meter here. The wall is about to fall down. You can tell with the boards up above the, the meter, uh, the termites have eaten them up. So we cut out a strip wide enough for one block. Next slide. After we got the blocks laid, here's what it looked like. Next slide. Um, Panama has a lot of beauty about it. 
Here are three parakeets that they caught in the wild. A lot of people have uh, parrots that they catch in the wild. Some people have monkeys, uh, but there's a lot of beautiful things to see in the country. Next slide. I uh, had the opportunity to preach at two congregations. This is one of them. This is Platania. Uh, this is our translator, uh, Udian, here by me as uh, I speak in, in uh, Platania. Next slide. This is uh, the congregation in El Tadao. Uh, going from the right, the third person over is a young man, and that's his family next to him there, including the guy with the, the uh, strap across his shoulder. That's his mom and dad there. Uh, he was recently baptized into Christ, and we are thankful for that. The guy with the striped shirt on, standing way over toward the left, is the young man who, the Christian, who died back in November, leaving his wife next to him uh, a widow. Next slide. This is their older son. Uh, his name is Isaac. Uh, his name is, um, I can't say his name in English. Uh, his name in Spanish is Isaiah. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is their uh, younger son. His nom name is Adrian. Um, the older boy has grown considerably since his dad's death spiritually because he wants to be like his dad. His dad was a very strong, spiritually speaking man, and we're so thankful for the uh, influence he was in the church during his life. Next slide. This is uh, Jessica. Um, you can't hardly see her in this slide, but uh, she and the boys are doing, I think, acceptable as far as their grief is concerned. She is so thankful for the support that Salem gave her, and I took down with me back in January, and I think they're going to be okay. Um, so they are very thankful for that, and she said, tell you thank you. In fact, all the people said, tell you hello. Next slide. This is the way of mixing concrete in Panama. You pour the sand and gravel out on the floor, the cement on top of that, and you mix it up, and then you pour water on it. The guy here to the right in the striped shirt is Jessica's dad. Um, the guy bending over with his head toward us is her brother. And I've forgotten, I can't say it off of the other guy to tell you who he was. Next shot. This is one of the floors that we poured, and this is one of the things that we had hoped to accomplish. Uh, next shot. Here's the water boy. Uh, they didn't have sufficient water the day we poured concrete. We had to go to the river to get water, and so I would fill up the five-gallon buckets and move them to the back of the truck so they could have them ready to pour on the concrete. Next shot. Uh, not a shot of them mixing the concrete. And next one, is that all? Okay, again, thank you so much for helping with the work there and giving me the opportunity to go down and be involved in that work. And maybe someday you can go with me. Thank you. Now our closing prayer. Till we see some of these pictures like this uh, makes us realize how blessed we are to be in this country that we have and even with all the trouble we have between Democrats and Independents and Socialists and Republicans, we're still the greatest country in the world and we want to continue to make it even greater. Would you bow with me? Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Andy, for MJ, for what they mean to this congregation. We thank you for the lessons that he's presented to us today. Uh, be with us now as we depart. 
keep all of us safe this week as we go about doing our normal business. May we always stop occasionally and thank you for the blessings that we do enjoy as being citizens of this country. Thank you for our church family here at Salem. Continue to be with us. Keep us safe. We look forward to being in heaven with all of us someday. Forgive us for our shortcomings as we close this service today. In Christ's name, amen.